Are you available to the Lord? Yes. Now, that means if God has a purpose for your life, and by the way, He does, are you committed to that? More than anything else, you want to be used by God. Now, many people will say, well, I haven't heard from God. I don't know about this call. I don't know of some divine purpose for my life. And that may be true. You don't know of it. But there's a reason for that. Because God will only speak to those who are wanting to obey. Those who are wanting to hear and put into action His call, His purpose. So when we have a desire to obey God, you're going to be amazed of the things that God will reveal to you. With that said, take out your Bible. We're going to be, both tonight and tomorrow, we're going to work our way through this book of Ezra. And Ezra was a unique man. We know in the scripture that Ezra, well, his name means help. And that's what he did. He came to Jerusalem in order to help those who were struggling to fulfill God's call. Not just in their life, but also for His people. And that's important because this people is going to be used by God in order to bring about the fulfillment of God's greater purpose, and that is to establish His kingdom. And when we look at the book of Ezra, what's unique is this. This book that bears His name, Ezra doesn't get to Jerusalem. Ezra doesn't begin to influence others and bring the people to a greater maturity until chapter 7 of 10 chapters. Meaning this, God had done a lot before Ezra came to the scene. And that's how it is for most of us. God has prepared things. God is at work. God is moving. He is bringing about change. So, when He calls us, things are already prepared. Amen. But here's the key. We need to purpose in our heart, God, what You would have me to do, I'm committed to. And when you do that, God is going to be able to move and bring you where He wants you to be. Now, when we look at Ezra, we see something. If you look at verse 1, we see that timing is so important. And when we look at verse 1, it says, In the first year of Korish, that is Cyrus. In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now, we know elsewhere that Cyrus is called the anointed one. And there's a key. Anointing only comes upon those who are submitting to the purposes of God. And Cyrus wasn't Jewish. We don't know much about him except what God revealed him to do, Cyrus was committed to. And God used him greatly. So in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, notice what it says, for the completion of the word of the Lord from the mouth of Jeremiah. Amen. Now, conclusion of what? Well, realize something. The vast majority of the Jewish people, they're not in Judah. They're not in Jerusalem. They're not worshiping there because there is no temple. The vast majority of the people are in exile. And God told the prophet Jeremiah and others that the people, because of rebelliousness, because of idolatry, because of putting self not only first, but exclusively wanting to do their will, what happened? God brought them into exile. And learn something. That word exile is a word of, of destruction. It brings down, it destroys the things that God wants to do. So the people, they witness that destruction, that destruction, that hardship, that pain, that sorrow, that loss. And they went into exile, as Jeremiah said, for a period of 70 years. Now, make a note of that. God is very precise. God doesn't say, you're just going to go there for an undisclosed amount of time. He prophesies right. and says, 70 years. Right. Now, that number 70 is important. When we look at numbers in the scripture, always they have meanings. They have significance. 
And when we look at the number 70, we get it by seven tens or ten seven. The number 10 is the number of completion. And the number 7 has to do with holiness, sanctification, or an easier way to understand it is that number 7 has to do with purpose. So Israel went into exile for a purpose. And that purpose is that they would be completely prepared for what God would have them to do. So learn something. When we go through a hardship, when God disciplines us, and remember, the scripture says, whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. He doesn't do it out of an anger to destroy. But if you have, and this is key, if you have a covenantal relationship with God, especially this new covenant by, as we sung about a few minutes ago, through the blood of Messiah, God, He may discipline he may judge, but there's a purpose for that. And that purpose will bring you back, and that's what God is doing here. This years of exile is coming to an end, and God is beginning to bring the people back to the Lord, yeah. back to Judah, back to His purpose. And we read, continuing on in verse 1, that God began to move exactly on time, Amen. in accordance with what? prophetic revelation. God does that. God moves. God brings about things always according to prophetic truth. That's right. And that's why if we don't understand prophecy, we're not going to be sensitive to what God's doing. You know, we're in Ezra, but a few books before this, Daniel. And Daniel was someone, and one of my favorite parts of the book of Daniel is Daniel chapter 9. And there Daniel prays. He realizes same biblical truth. He discerns the time. And he knows that according to the prophet Jeremiah, the exile is coming to an end. And therefore Daniel prays prophetically in order to prepare the people for what God was going to do. And here it is. This is how he does it. Look at the middle of verse 1. It says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Korish, the king of Persia. Amen. Now, this stirring always has to do with something that's spiritual. Yeah. This stirring only has to do with someone who is listening for spiritual Amen. revelation. So, Korish, or Cyrus, he is a Gentile, but for some reason, he's interested in what God wants from him. He's seeking to be used by God. And notice it says that the Lord, not just God, but this sacred name of God, the God who transcends all things, He stirs up the spirit of this man, and notice what He did. He didn't conceal it. He wasn't shy about it, but He was bold. He caused the voice, that is, He sent out those who would proclaim. Literally in the text, it simply says, he, he caused a sound or a voice to pass. But we know how he did it. He sent out people, and this shows a significance. He hired individuals to do something. Now imagine this. This, this man from a non-Jewish background, we would think of a pagan background, but now he's using his resources as king. He's making a statement. And he sends out these individuals throughout all of his kingdom. And that is a lot of providences. If you look from time at the book of Esther, hopefully you read Esther not too long ago, as we just celebrated Purim. But in the book of Esther, it says that this same empire had 127 providences. So he sent individuals not just 127, but many in each province, to go out and proclaim, and he also, look at the end of verse 1, also letters. So he had it written down, he posted it, and he also sent people out in public squares, in all cities, in order to proclaim how God had spoken to him. Now, this is a man that was excited about hearing God's voice. Let me ask you a question. Does that describe you? Are you interested in hearing what God has to say to you? Here's the problem. Most people, most believers, 
See, this is how you answer the question. When I pray, how much time is my prayer life just sitting still and listening to God? If your time of prayer is beginning with you making this request, saying these things, and at the end saying, Amen, and you're off to something else, you're not interested in hearing from God. That is not biblical prayer. Prayer has a component of listening. And this man, Cyrus, he heard from God and he responded with boldness. So he says, verse 2, Thus says Koresh, the king of Persia, and all the kingdoms of the earth, God has given to me, what God, this transcendent God, the Lord, the God of heavens. And he has charged me. Now here's what it's saying. This man who was open to God's revelation, he heard from God and he was aware of what God had called him to do. And what was that? Notice. He has charged me to build for him a temple. Literally the word is house. A temple in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, this would have been a radical statement. Here you have a Persian king saying that God, what God? The God of heavens. And not just the God of heavens, but he uses that unique name. Those four letters that refer to God, yud vav -Heh. So he has a special revelation of this transcendent God who told him to build a temple in Jerusalem. Now, when you look at this first chapter, as we're going to do tonight, you're going to see over and over, there's an emphasis upon Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. In fact, in this first chapter, six times the name Jerusalem appears. And that is significant because six is related to God's grace. And here's what we're seeing. Korish he was a recipient of God's grace and it manifested itself through obedience to the Word of God. So God charged him, commissioned him to build for him a house in Jerusalem. Look now to verse 3. Now I would suggest to you that Ezra is very prophetic as well. We can look at the events in Ezra and see that it can have a last day fulfillment. Why do I say this? Because there is going to be under this man's leadership, Korsh, there is going to be a return back to the land. And in the same way that that return was necessary, and don't miss this, you see, God moved Korsh to bring the people out of exile back to the land. And one of the purposes of this no one knew this better than Daniel, was for Messiah's first coming. It was a requirement for Messiah to come the first time that the people be back in the land. And likewise, God is, and He's in the midst of it now. He's already began it 70 years ago when He began to bring Jewish people back to the land. It is prophetic. It is happening in our days. And in the same way that it was necessary for this to take place for Messiah to come the first time, it's happening again because Messiah is going to come a second time. And this time is for the purpose of establishing His kingdom. Amen. So look again at verse 2. He says here, to build for Him a house in Jerusalem. And then He says in verse 3, who among you from all His people? Now, initially, he speaks about the sons of Jacob, the Jewish people. He says, who among you from all of his people may his God be with him? Now, here's the key. Korish is giving the call. He is telling, he is speaking for God saying, you people, you have a call to go back to the land. And if you do that, what does God promise? says, and the Lord will be with him. So when we obey God, a very important principle, 
When we submit, when we go to the places that God wants us to go to, and we do the things that God calls us to do, we can be assured. Look at verse 3. It says, And His God will be with His people to go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and notice, to build the temple of the Lord, Amen. the God of what? The God of Israel. Amen. Now, here again, this is problematic, and we're going to see it later on. Why do I say problematic? Because Israel, in that day, it was known as not just a nation, but it was known as an empire. And this is what would have been troublesome. Because now you have a Persian king who ruled over a Persian empire being concerned with a different empire. An empire called Israel, and you're going to see that Israel and the establishment of that nation, according to the purposes of God, according to what God has done in the past through this people in this land, well, it is going to become very controversial in this book. And guess what? It is still controversial today. Amen. You're going to find, just like we're going to see, that when the people go back and they begin to do the purpose of God, carry out the will of God, we're going to see that those around Judah, those next to Jerusalem, they are very burdened by it and they see it in exactly the wrong way. Because Israel, God has sovereignty, committed Himself to build a people up supernatural. You need to remember that. That Israel did not come about naturally. Just think for a moment about the descendant of Abraham, and I'm calling about Yitzchak or Isaac. When we look at the New Testament, we find that, that Paul says that he is a child of what? Promise. Very important. God made a promise, and here's what we can be assured of. God keeps promises. Amen? Amen. And therefore, he supernaturally opened up, some would say recreated the womb of Sarah. And he gave this woman conception. Didn't happen naturally. God moved. And in that same way, he did so in order that he had a supernatural purpose for this people. And that purpose involved the nations. So here's what you have. You have the people that God created to be a blessing to the nations, hated by the nations. Why? Because they've been deceived. They do not understand God's provision. And the real battle is this. Whether they're going to submit to God's revelation, see His truth in order that they might be participant with the things of God or not. And that's really something that we all have to answer. Are we interested in participating in the things of God? You know what most people want? God to participate in my plan. God doesn't do that. He only works within His plan, and He only blesses those who participate with His plan. If you don't, you're going to be very frustrated. And let me tell you, most believers today, if you get real serious with them, and you ask them about their spiritual condition, how they're feeling, you know what they answer? Frustrated. They're discouraged. Because they don't sense God working in their life. And the answer is to this frustration. Is your life participating in the things of God? And almost always, you know what they say? I don't know what the things of God are. I don't know what He wants for me. I don't know about any call, what we talked about earlier. Because they are focused upon self and their objective. What we're going to find is this. The people, not just Ezra, but there's others that we're going to meet. They were all committed to the things of God. So notice what it says. To build a temple, middle of verse 3, of the Lord, the God of Israel. Now who's speaking? Cyrus is. And he makes this bold proclamation. Think about this. His empire was full of idolatry. Yeah. There were numerous gods yeah. that the Persians saw as sacred. And what did he say? He says, Hu ha Elohim. That is, he is the God. Yeah. Not a God. But he says, he is the God. And the implication is, the one and only God. It would have been controversial. 
I mean, for, for Cyrus to go and say, well, I'm believing in this God. This is my God. There's other gods. You can believe what you want to believe. You can worship the way you want to worship. That's fine. But this is my way. That's not controversial. But when you say, no, there is only one God, the God of Israel, that becomes problematic. You know what? Cyrus didn't care. Cyrus wasn't looking for approval from man. He didn't need that. He was seeking this man one thing, and that is to be obedient to God. And that's why the anointing was upon him. Look now to verse 4. And all the ones who remain from all the places where he is surged, sojourning there. Now he's talking about individuals, first of all, Jewish individuals, from the seed of Yaakov, the seed of Jacob, that will not go back to Jerusalem. For whatever reason. Notice what he says. For those who are remaining from all the places where he is dwelling or sojourning there, let him do something. It says, let, let them lift up. Now, this is a term of encouragement. You know, you may not be going back to Israel, but encourage those who do. Encourage them, notice what he says, with silver and gold, and it uses the Hebrew word rachush, which means possessions. Whatever you may have, Silver, gold, your possessions, also animals, with this donation. Meaning, there's two things going on here. One is a donation to be given for the building of the temple. That's one thing. Amen. But those who aren't going back, they might still give for the building of the temple, but even the second offering is given to those who are going back. Those who are going back, in order that the house of God might be established in, and here's the third time, in Jerusalem. Look at verse 5. Now, what I like about this is that God revealed this to one man, Cyrus. Cyrus, he didn't take counsel. He didn't go to anyone and said, well, do you think I should do this? Does this make sense to you? Is this going to be politically good for me? He didn't ask any of those questions. What did he do? He simply obeyed God. doesn't matter who you are. King or someone who has a very simple occupation. It doesn't matter. It's the same principle. What God reveals, do. So he responded, and notice what it says in verse 5. There was indeed a response from the people. It says, literally, the heads of the fathers, meaning the leaders of each family. They rose up. Those who were leaders in Judah and Benjamin, that is, those two tribes. Because the exile of the Babylonians primarily happened to two and a half tribes, right? Yeah. We have the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Judah, and there was also some from the tribe of Levi. Remember? They had no inheritance of the land. So there was two tribes in that southern kingdom, remember, that nation of Israel, after Malach Shlomo, after King Solomon, it was divided. There was two king, two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin, and nine tribes, not ten, nine tribes in that northern kingdom that was called Israel. And that final tribe, the tribe of Levi, had no inheritance of land. And they were scattered about through many cities, both in the northern kingdom and in the southern kingdom. And so some of the Levites, they also went into exile. And that's why we see here, look carefully at verse 5. The leaders of the fathers, meaning the leaders of each tribe, what two tribes? Judah and Benjamin, but also, it says, the priests, the Kohanim, the Levim, the Levites. It says, and all those, whom the God. Very interesting. It doesn't say God, but we won't have it in English. But in Hebrew, there's that definite article, the word the. Over and over, people are responding to this because they recognize only one God. Amen. Now, there is much false teaching today. 
You hear that the God of, of Israel, the God that Judaism speaks to, the God of Christianity, well, we know it's the God of Israel, right? right. But there are those who teach that Islam worships that same God. No, they do not. No, they do not. I know many Muslims. See many Muslims in the airports. And I'll speak to some. And they'll say, well, we're cousins. I'll say, not exactly. Not exactly. <laughs> say, Who is your God? And I've never had one of them say, you know, Allah and the God of Israel are the same. They know he's not. They would never say that. No Muslim. Because they have a problem with that term Israel. Now, I was speaking to someone today, and we were talking about a teacher, a popular teacher, and they were mentioning the Antichrist. And they were saying that the Antichrist, this teacher that they were quoting, the Antichrist is going to be Islamic. No, he's not. Guarantee it. No, he's not. That is a false teaching. How can I be so sure? Well, you know, Islam is a, a very very it's a religion of conflict among themselves Muslims do not get along in fact Muslims kill more than anyone else who did they kill other Muslims there is great conflict but there's one thing that any Muslim if he follows the Quran there's one thing that they all agree with and that is a hatred for what Israel they want to destroy Israel but when you look at the Antichrist, you're going to find that what Islam says about the Antichrist is not what the Bible says about the Antichrist. So many people say that. It is false. Because the Antichrist is going to do something. The Antichrist is going to try to woo the Jewish people to him. The Antichrist is going to do many things that seemingly look good and positive to the Jewish people. The Antichrist is going to bring about peace and security for Israel. The Antichrist is going to want a temple to be built and oversee a temple being built. Why? Because he thinks falsely, incorrectly, but he is following a plan at first that is trying to get the Jewish people to worship him. Let me give you another lie that I hear so often. Many people ask me, don't you think that the Antichrist will be a Jew? I'll say, no. Why do you think that? They say, well, I don't think the Jewish people would follow the Antichrist if he wasn't Jewish. Where in the scripture <laughs> does it say the Jewish people follow or embrace the Antichrist? If you know your Bible well, there is going to be a time, right? Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. There is going to be a time of, of great persecution, right? We call that Yaakov, a time of trouble for Yaakov. When does that begin? Immediately after the abomination of desolation, correct? That is when the Antichrist is going to go into the Holy of Holies and proclaim that he is God and the Jewish people are going to reject him. And it's the Jewish rejection of the Antichrist that's going to lay the foundation for this worst time, and I want to emphasize this, the worst time of persecution for the Jewish people at the hand of the Antichrist. So when we look at what the Old Testament, the New Testament says about the Antichrist, there's no way, no way that the Antichrist is going to be Islamic. Look again at verse 5. It says, The God stirred up His Spirit, whoever it is, in order to go up and to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Fourth time, house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And from all those that are surrounding, let them strengthen the hand. Here again. Strengthen those with, with silver and with gold. And that same word with, with, with what you have, your possessions with animals, and with your, your donations. Besides that which you have donated, and the implication is for the temple. Verse 7. Now, verse 7 is where it gets, in my opinion, very interesting. 
Because we're talking about exile. Exile of the Jewish people. But the exile was more than this. If you read carefully about the prophet Ezekiel, I was talking to my friend Derek, who came all the way from Minneapolis to our conference this weekend, and he was reading a little bit about Ezekiel in this afternoon. And when you read Ezekiel, you'll find something. Before the Jewish people went into exile, who went first? Ezekiel says, God did. God departed from Jerusalem from that Holy of Holies. He left there. He exited through the eastern gate. Read some time. Ezekiel chapter, I believe, 43 and 44 it talks about God. And it emphasized that eastern gate. And it says, God is going to return in the millennial kingdom. And He is going to come through the eastern gate. And the Shekinah Hashem, that's that Shekinah glory, is going to return to that place where it was. So Ezekiel tells us previously, the glory of God, His presence left and went into Babylon prior to the people arriving there. And it emphasizes, even in the midst of judgment, even in the midst of punishment, God does not leave or forsake His people. And now God is restoring things. And look at verse, verse 7. Not only, not only did the people go into exile, but also the temple vessels. Verse 7, And the king Korish, that is Cyrus, he brought out the vessels from the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought out from Jerusalem. And he, that is Nebuchadnezzar, had set them in the house of his God, that is that pagan God. So all of those, all of those precious vessels, those holy vessels, what happened to them? They were carried away from Jerusalem and put into a pagan shrine. But God, he is faithful. In the same way that God wants to bring the people back, God brings back all, and if you keep reading in chapter 1, there is a count. They account for all of these vessels. And what was taken is now what? Here's the key. It is restored. Amen. There is a very powerful word that we need to remember. And that is restoration. And there's a relationship between restoration, again, what we sung about earlier tonight. And that is redemption. It is only through redemption... And redemption, it involves blood. Amen. It is only through the blood of Messiah that we can experience redemption. And one of the many implications of redemption is restoration. Earlier this week, we were in Central Florida. And I had the opportunity to teach on the book of Joel. And in there it says that God is going to restore all what the locusts. Not just one type of locust. If you read Joel well, there's four different types of locusts. One comes first, and whatever he leaves behind, the second type comes and devours that. And what they leave behind, the third comes. Until finally the fourth comes, and there is nothing left. Everything has been destroyed, but God is able to restore with those locusts. Not just locusts. But what those locusts have devoured. And God does that through the power of redemption. So notice verse 8. And Korish brought them out, all of these vessels. Korish, the king of Persia, by means of this one man, and his name is Mitradat, who is the treasure. And they counted, he counted them. And he entrusted them to a man, Shashbatsar, who was the, the president, the leader of Judah. And all of this was to show, and you can read on into chapter 1 and see the perfect accounting of these vessels. Look at the end of chapter 1. The end of verse 11 says, And all of these, all of these vessels that were brought up, each and every one, they were accounted for, and all of them, Sheshbazar, 
when he went up with those who went up from the exile from Babylon to Jerusalem, he brought them. Now, God is bringing about a restoration, but with a purpose. When you look at this first chapter, yes, God's moved among a very unlikely servant, one who, and the Persians, you know, for most of this empire, the Jewish people suffered. But at the right time, and that's so important, what's the right timing? God's timing. Right. According to prophetic truth, God moved to bring about restoration. He moved to return the people back where they needed to be. Why do I say needed to be? Needed to be for God's program, God's plans, and God's purposes to be fulfilled in the life of who? The nations. Not just the Jewish people, but this has worldwide implications. So God brings about this complete restoration. And go into chapter 2. We see here, there's a list. God is spe specific. He is very, very precise on keeping a record of who went up. And we have it in chapter 2. It says, these are the sons of the nation, referring to this empire. The ones who went up out of exile, from the captivity of exile, which Nebuchadnezzar, he had exiled. This king of Babylon, and he had exiled them to Babylon. But these are the ones who returned. Now, there's a play on word here. Because this word for return is also the same word for repentance. And it's not by chance. It is with the providence of God that this word, only in Hebrew, do we find it in this way. That they returned, but they repented. They experienced restoration because of repentance. Realize something. Restoration is a byproduct of repentance. So it says, and they were restored to where? Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, what a great word Jerusalem is, is it not? And that's why it, it bothers me when, when people want to use a different term rather than Jerusalem. For example, you will find if you read many of the documents of the United Nations or many of the documents of the European Union, Instead of using the term Jerusalem, they will use the term Al-Quds, referring to the Muslim, the Muslim perspective for that place, not the biblical one. You see, Jerusalem, you know that is a wonderful word. You know what it means? It comes from two Hebrew words. The first one, to inherit, Yeresh. To inherit or to possess. And we all know the last word, right? Shalom. You know what shalom is? Not just peace. It, peace is really the outcome from what that word really means. Because the word peace comes from a verb which means to make full or fulfill. So peace is the outcome of the fulfillment of what? God's will. You only have that peace. What Paul speaks of, that peace that passes all understanding. You'll only experience that. When you are in the midst of fulfilling God's will. So if you're not interested in His plan, His purposes, His objectives for your life, you are what you're saying is, I'm not interested in really experiencing peace. I don't want to possess those things that God wants for me. What are those things? His blessings, His promises, those covenantal promises that we only find through that relationship, a covenantal relationship, which is established through redemption. So we read here, and it says, and they returned to Jerusalem. What does that mean? Not just that they came to that city, they were located in that place, but more than that, they began to receive, to have restoration to those things that God wanted them to have. And not only that, notice the outcome. See, these words are important because it says repentance, Jerusalem, and then what does it say? Judah. You know what Judah means? 
it has to do with praising God. The term Yehuda means to throw praise. And this word throw means in a very lavish way. It's not a specific. It is a word that speaks of, of just throwing something. Let me give an example of this. Last weekend, at this time, we were, we were in Dallas. And I was asked to speak upon the Passover. And you remember in Matthew 26, there's, there's really a commandment, a New Testament commandment about Passover. And it has to do with whenever the gospel is proclaimed, there is another story you have to tell, is there not? Messiah says, whenever this gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed, the deed of this woman, remember that woman that came with that alabaster uh, 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 jar of precious oil? And it says the first time that she poured it out upon him. And that uses a word for pouring like a drink, something specific. But when Yeshua spoke about it later on to his disciples that, that didn't get it, right? They didn't appreciate it. They didn't understand it. Why or the love that she had that caused her to do that? No, if you read carefully in Matthew 26, Yeshua says, not that she poured it on, he changed the word. He uses the word balo, what we get the English word ball from. And in Greek, that word means to throw something. To throw it, to pass it over. Not in a careful way, but in a very, very bold. In a very, very extravagant way. And what we find here is that this word for praise, Yehuda, means the same thing. Just doesn't mean quietly but in a very bold, in a very lavish, in a very, very profound way. And notice what it says. Repentance leads to receiving the promises of God, experiencing that peace, and the outcome of that is a praise, a praise that, that most people we're not familiar with, but a praise. And it says, and each man returned where? To his city. Another reference of restoration. So, God, if we listen to Him with the desire to obey, if we listen to Him saying, God, whatever, ever you put upon my heart to do, I'll do it with boldness. I don't care what others might think, what others might say. I'll do it. That's Korish. That's Cyrus. He didn't think about it from anyone's other perspective. Why? Because he heard from God. And he was passionate and committed and wanted to participate in what was pleasing to God. And through that, well, the world was forever changed. In fact, because of that, your life, my life, our children's life will be eternally changed. These things that he did, I doubt if most people in his kingdom, would see the significance, they would have said, what is he thinking? What is he doing? In fact, we're going to see later on in our study how the world thought about Korsh and what he had began and what other kings continued on. We're going to see that when God's moves moving, there is great resistance to him. Father God, we thank you that you are God to today still is moving in the lives of those who are listening, listening to obey, listening to participate in your will, doing that which is pleasing to you, doing that which is honoring to you, doing that which is going to move your program forward. And we thank you for the privilege, the honor, and the intimacy that we receive from walking with you in your will. We thank you that you are a God that calls us into your service. In that blessed name of Messiah Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen.